Good morning. So good to see everybody this morning. Everybody who hasn't ran out of town anyway. We've got a number of folks visiting with us today and we're particularly thankful that you're here. Uh, some who have traveled a good distance. I think more than one family who's traveled a good distance to be with us for various reasons. And we're so glad that you've decided to be with us today as well. Last Sunday we began a new monthly series as we've been doing this year on the idea of the church matters. And the mentality behind this, for those who weren't here last week for the explanation, is that we live in a, in a society, not just secularly, but religiously, that has devalued the concept of religion to such an extent that a good majority of people in our world today no longer even if they consider themselves to be Christian, no longer see being a part of a local church or participating in what has come to be called organized religion even important anymore. The idea is that, that we can become Christians and then we can just basically go it alone. We can stay to ourselves, we can live in solitude, we never have to be around other people of like nature, of like faith. There's never really anything that is expected of us. There's no cooperation that has to be done in order to accomplish a common goal. And so the mentality that we're trying to develop through this month is the biblical reality that when God designed Christianity, He designed it in a particular way, with a particular purpose, according to a particular function that includes the concept of the church. And the reality that even though we live in a society that says the church does not matter anymore, Biblically, that just simply is not accurate. Biblically speaking, the church matters. And we want to emphasize that reality throughout the month of March. Today I want to begin with a question though, a personal question. I want you to respond to yourself. Because the way that you respond to this question in your own mind has a lot to do with how you view whether or not the church really matters. And the question I want to ask you is, what is the church? Answer that to yourself. What, when I say the word church, what is it that you envision? What's the first thought that comes to your mind? Because when you answer that question you, and you answer it openly, honestly, you don't answer it in a way that, well, I, I, I really think this, but I've always been, been told this, and so this is what I'm going to think, just so I don't feel guilty. I want you to think, what do you really think about when I say the word church? If you were to give an open and honest definition of what the idea or what the word church means, what would it be? And the reason it's so important that you do this is because the way that you answer that question goes a long way in determining whether or not in your life the church really does matter. Because I, I sincerely believe that a lot of the lack of interest... The, the devaluation of the local church, of organized religion, has to do with confusion. And a misunderstanding of what the church, what organized religion, so to speak, is supposed to be about. Not what it actually has become in many areas. To be honest, I'm just as disgusted as many people as to what church and organized religion has become to many people. I, I don't want you to think about what it's become, though. I want you to think at its root, at its core, what is it supposed to be? Because if we can surpass confusion as to what the church is supposed to be, 
then we're going to be one step closer in our lives to the realization that the church does matter. Now, confusion surrounding the idea of the church is many and varied. We could stand here probably all day and more talking about different misunderstandings or different confusing concepts that people have developed over time with regard to the church It may have to do with the confusion that the church is just this structure in which we're assembled. That that this building is the holy place. It's, It's the church. Or that confusion may have to do with the idea that that when I say the word church, your immediate reaction is that we think about a religious service. That, you know, we come to church... We come and and, and we do church, and and then when church is over, then we go home. Or it could be about any other number of false impressions with regard to what the church is. Because honestly, when, when we are able to, in our minds, encapsulate the idea of the church to a physical structure that on occasion we come to, and then ultimately we leave... Or if we're able to encapsulate the idea of church into a religious service that we come to, that we begin, that we end, and then that we depart from, then we have made it so impersonal that there's not really any surprise when in the lives of many people the church just doesn't matter anymore. This morning I want us to focus our attention on another principle under this general idea of the the reality that the church matters and why the church matters by talking about three biblical designations that you see in the New Testament that are used to describe God's original intention and His intended function of the church. Because I think when you look at these designations, they're far more than than just names. They are intended to be definitions. Definitions of what God wants for the church to be. And on multiple occasions throughout the New Testament, you see the inspired writers going into deep discussion, trying to get across to those first century Christians to whom they wrote and to us as the benefactors of what they wrote as to how we can apply the concept of the church into each of these three terms. The body, the kingdom... And the church. First of all, this morning, let's begin with the idea of the body. The church in the New Testament is depicted as a body. And it's depicted as a body in terms of how God saw fit to design the church. Colossians 1 and verse 18, Paul says, I identify this, this designation with regard to the church, to those folks. And in verse 18, he said it in this way, that, that he, talking about Jesus Christ, is the head of the body, the church. An elliptical statement used in order to describe what he had just said. The body is the church, the church is the body, and the church as a body has Jesus as its head who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. Now I imagine most everybody in here either has or perhaps currently is in some type of science class where you study the human body. Even even it, it may be perhaps the most rudimentary information at the youngest of ages. But I would imagine in some way in a school setting you have studied the human body. And how the human body, of course they wouldn't use this word, but you and I obviously would, 
how the human body is designed and how the human body functions and how each part of the human body has a responsibility that is all ultimately connected and controlled by what? The central nervous system in the head. In the human body, the head is, is the headquarters basically where all the decision-making processes are made that controls every other function of the body which works independently with different functions but all according to the same purpose which is whatever it is that we in our minds want to do. Now in Colossians 1, Paul is, is kind of using that as an illustration. The church is a body and Christ is its head. And as serving as head, Christ is the authority. He is the decision-making process. And everything that the body does is intended to be controlled by what that head determines it wants to see done. But you know, when we talk about the church in terms of a body, we spend a lot of time talking about the function of the head, and rightfully so. We need to talk about the authority of Jesus Christ and how He is supposed to control everything that we as the body does. I want to take focus off of the head, though, for a few minutes this morning. And I want us to talk about the body section, us. And, and, and what it is that we as the body are supposed to be doing and how we are supposed to function and how God designed us in this particular way. And I'm thankful that I don't have to rely on my own wisdom to do this because, well, let's just be honest, that would be a waste of all of our time. Now we can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and see where Paul himself addressed the idea of the church being designed in the form of a body. You remember in the book of 1 Corinthians that the Corinthian Christians had become just terribly, terribly divided in a lot of different areas. Chapter 1, verse 10, he said, To them it's been reported unto me by those of the house of Chloe that there are divisions among you, but I beseech you, brethren, that there be no divisions among you, but, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And then through the rest of the book, basically what he does is he goes through and he identifies all of these different division, uh, divisions that existed among them, all of these different dividing factors. And he addresses them, them in terms of how they need to fix them. And one of those dividing factors that was present among the, the Christians in Corinth had to do with pride. Those Corinthian Christians had just be become incredibly and overly proud of themselves individually, not collectively, individually, based on their individual abilities given to them by God, miraculous gifts in that context. And because they had become so proud individually, some who might have had the gift of prophecy uh, 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 exalting their gift among others who might have had the gift of tongues, who, who, who exalted themselves above others who had the gift to interpret tongues, who exalted themselves above others who had the, the capability of healing sicknesses. And what had happened was not only had they become individually proud among themselves, but in the course had begun to devalue each other as brethren. Their basic attitude was, I can do this, I'm better than you are. And their response was, well, I can do this, so I'm better than you are. And they weren't working together as a body, as a single unit of people to accomplish the purpose of their head. They were all working individually to no common purpose but their own selfish ambition. And so Paul began that chapter, 1 Corinthians 12, by reminding them beginning in verse 4, that, that there are diversities of gifts. 
You all have different abilities. You've all been blessed with, with different talents. But guess what, folks? They all came from the same Spirit. And there are diversities of, of ministrations, of, of service. They said they all come from the same Lord. And there are diversities of workings, but the same God who works all things in all. In other words, Corinthian Christians, you might all have your own individual talents, gifts spiritually that, that really aren't yours to begin with. They're given to you by God. But you all may have your own individual gifts, but they all, number one, came from God, and number two, are intended to glorify the same God. And, and with that in mind, he goes on and he dresses about how some had all of these different gifts, the gift of faith, the gift of healing, the gift of prophecy, so on and so forth. But verse 11, this is what he says. All these, all of these spiritual gifts he's just listed. He said, all of these work the one and the same Spirit, dividing to each severally, even as He will. And then based on that statement, look at what he says in verse 12. For as the body is one. He's talking about the physical body. As the body is one and has many members and, and all the members of the body being many are one body, so also, here's the illustration, here's the application, so also is Christ. You look at your, your physical body. And just as you have one body that is made up of different component parts, so then is Christ one body that also has different component parts. So is the church one body that has different component parts. Christ as its head, and we as the members of that body, who might all have different functions, just like those Corinthian Christians. We might have different functions today. Not miraculous gifts as they had, but we can still have different functions. I may be able to do things that, that some others can't do, and you may be able to do things that I can't do. Or you may be able to do things over here that they can't do and vice versa. We may all bring different functions to the table, but as a body, we are intended to work together toward the common purpose of our head, which is Christ. And you remember that same chapter that Paul even went on to talk about how silly the, 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 the fights and the arguments they were having among one another were. He said, could you imagine if your eye said to your ear, well, I can't hear, I can only see, and so I serve no purpose whatsoever. Or if the ear had said to the eye, well, I can't see, I can only hear, and so I serve no purpose whatsoever. He said, you're fussing and exalting of one another above each other because of your function is as stupid as your parts of your body trying to exalt themselves above each other and devaluing each other. He said, you all have different functions. Just work together and accomplish the same purpose. Folks, we have the same responsibility today. Church was the body in the first century, and it's still intended by design to function as a body today, which means what? That I have a responsibility as a part of that body. I can't stand alone in my faith. That's not how God designed Christianity. If I'm a Christian, He's made me a part of the body. And if you're a Christian, He's made you a part of the body. And as a part of the body, guess what? We have a function that we need to accomplish. I expect my hand to do certain things. I expect my eye to do certain things. I expect my ear to do certain things. And if they're not functioning appropriately, guess what? We seek help. We as members of this body have responsibilities. And if we're not functioning in the way that we're supposed to function, then the body is not functioning 
as it should. The New Testament describes the church in terms of a body in the way that God designed it. And the way that we function needs to be exactly as God designed it. We need to work together as a body. Number two, not only in the New Testament do you see the inspired writers talking about the church in terms of a body, you see the New Testament also in Christ Himself going on to talk about the kingdom and the church in terms of it being a kingdom. And in the same way that it's a body in the way that it's designed, it's a kingdom because of who has dominion. And also in the way that we together function. You remember in Matthew chapter 16, when Christ and His disciples, it says in verse, uh, verse 14 or so, came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and, and you remember the conversation that He had with them, whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? Some say that you're, you're uh, Elias, some say you're Jeremiah, some say you're John, uh, uh, John the Baptist, some say you're one of the prophets. And then he asked that immortal question, but whom say ye that I am? And Peter responded on their behalf and said, well, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. How did Jesus respond to that? Well, first, he gave that, that individual reply to Peter. Blessed art thou, Simon and Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which art in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then he responds to them as a group and says, And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In that response that Jesus gave to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, notice that he talks about the same entity using two different terms. Verse 18, Upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. At beginning of verse 18, I will give unto thee the keys of the what? The kingdom of heaven. Is he talking about two distinct bodies? Two distinct entities? Two distinct institutions? No, he's speaking of one in interchangeable terms. In that conversation, the church is the kingdom. The kingdom is the church. And in the same way that we're identified as, as a body and Christ is our head, when you look at the church in terms of it being a kingdom in the New Testament, you see much the same arrangement made. Because the New Testament has made it clear to further the illustration of the church being a kingdom in 1 Timothy 6.15 that Christ is identified as what? King of kings and Lord of lords. And just like in any kingdom that has ever existed, Jesus has been given as King supreme authority to which all those subject to Him are to submit. He, he said that Himself in Matthew 28, 18, didn't He? All power, authority, hath been given unto Me in heaven and in earth. And then based on that authority, what does He do? He, he commissions His disciples to do something. Go ye into all the world and teach the gospel to every creature. Authority. Jesus has the authority as King over the kingdom of which He reigns. And we are His subjects. We are those citizens of that kingdom whose responsibility it is to submit to Him as King. To do what it is that He's told us to do. To accomplish whatever purpose it is that He has told us to accomplish. And you know, in any kingdom of ancient days, disobedience of the king was not something to be taken lightly, was it? Direct disobedience of the king was a punishable offense, most often by death. And it's not ironic. Christ serving as our king who has supreme authority and we who are to be subject to him have the responsibility to obey, to submit to, to subject ourselves to the authority of our king 
And yet if we are found in direct disobedience to Him, well, the wages of sin, Romans 6.23 says, is death. The church, the church, it isn't, it isn't a structure that we can come to and leave and, 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 and compartmentalize that idea of Christianity. It's, it's not a religious service that, that we come to, that we start, that we stop and then we leave and we can compartmentalize that, that segment of our lives. The church is our life because we are the church. I am a part of that body. I am a citizen in that kingdom. And as a part of that body, I have a function. As a citizen in that kingdom, I have a responsibility. Then, of course, we see that third designation, the one that, of course, is used most often. But even it has significance behind it. The church is a body in the way that it's designed. It's a kingdom in the sense of who has dominion. But it's the church because of, of what it does. Remember in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9 that Peter is writing to that church as we've been talking about for some time now on Wednesday night, for those who are in here anyway. He's writing to that church who was enduring trial. They were scattered abroad. They were dispersed because of what was happening under Rome's heavy hand. And to those Christians who were dispersed because of persecution, this is what Peter told them. You're an elect race. You are a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. And you're a people unto God's own possession. That you may show forth the praises of Him who's done what? Who's called you out called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. That verse specifically, that, that, those last few words of that verse, perfectly illustrate what the church, by the designation of the church, is supposed to be. The word church comes from an ancient Greek word, compound word which literally means the called out ones, just as you see here in 1 Peter 2, 9. We are the called out ones. We have been called out of the world to live separated lives, distinct lives. In the King James, in, in 1 Peter 2, 9, it, it refers to us as a peculiar people, different. Not like everybody else around us. But when people look at us as Christians, what are they supposed to be, see? They're supposed to see something that's different. Something that they don't see when they look around the rest of the world. God doesn't want us, in other words, to just blend into society. Which is the exact opposite of the message we're hearing in so many ways that the church needs to change to meet the norms of society. If we do that... We are no longer the church. We're something completely different. Because the church, by definition, by designation, by responsibility in what we do, we are supposed to be different. Called out. Now think about it in terms of what Paul said back in Romans chapter 12. When he told those Roman Christians, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice, to be holy and acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual service, and be not conformed. The American Standard says, be not fashioned according to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that, that you may prove what is that good and that acceptable and that perfect will of God. And when we live separated lives as children of God, that makes us a part of the church. When we are called out by the gospel, when we, when we respond to that call to be called out of the world and into the marvelous light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we are obedient to that gospel, that makes us a part of the church. It makes us one of the called out ones. 
But you know, if we, if we devalue the church, guess what we're also devaluing? If we take the position that the church doesn't matter, if we devalue the church, we are devaluing the importance of living separated lives. And if we devalue the importance of living separated lives, guess what we've also devalued? Guess what we've missed? If we devalue the the idea of living separated lives, we have missed the entire point of Christianity. We have missed it all. The church matters because it is the representation of the decision that people have made to live lives that are separate from sin. To live lives that are separate from the world. And so if if the church doesn't matter, living lives apart from sin doesn't matter either. Because the church is, is the called out ones. We represent those who have responded to the call to come out of sin. And so the church matters because it, as the church, does something, or at least it's supposed to, is to avoid sin and live lives that are distinct according to God's true purpose. Now go back to to the way that we began that discussion this morning. Think back to the way that you answered that question, what is the church? And when you responded to yourself to that question, what is the church? Were you a part of the answer? Because if you were not personally a part of the answer, either, number one, you you were confused with regard to what the idea of of the church is. Or number two, if you weren't in that answer, it's because you weren't confused as to what the church is supposed to be. You're just not a part of it. Both of those can be corrected this morning. Really, I hope one already has. If there was anybody that was, that, that, that misunderstood... The, the biblical idea of what, of what the local church, of what organized religion is supposed to be. I hope that confusion is gone, if there was any to begin with. But, but number two, if you understood it properly, but you just weren't a part of it, that needs to be corrected too. And that's only something that you can do. But you can do it today and you can do it quite easily if you would just be willing to give your life to God. Now, now how does that happen? Well, this is what the Bible says about how it happens. We accept what God has told us through His Word. We believe it. We accept it. And based on that conviction of what we now believe, we we turn from the sin that's in our lives. We, We put it away. We acknowledge publicly with the spoken word that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and, and we, we, we are immersed in water. Why? Well, because God said so. And that's the only reason we need. Whether I understand its importance or not is irregardless. Secondary to the reality that, that God just told me to do it. And when we're immersed in water, the, 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 the Bible says that we contact the blood of Christ, our sins are washed away, we're added to the church, the body of the kingdom. We live in a state of forgiveness. And we're able to look forward in anticipation to eternity. Maybe you're here this morning and you've done that. And you are technically, if you want to look at it that way, part of His church, but, but you're not living like it. Because you've given your life back to sin, well, that can be corrected too. If you would turn from that sin in your life as well and and confess it, pray to Him for forgiveness. Just come and do that. He promises that He'll forgive you of your sin. 
He'll wash, wash it clean by the blood of His Son. He'll remember that sin and that iniquity no more. And we can go on through our lives being the body, being the kingdom, living as the church. And we want every single soul here to do that, to do it this morning, to do it right now, while together we stand and sing. Yeah.